Hi and welcome to exercise two of Fundamentals of Mocha. And here we're going to be taking a look at the user interface and just seeing what some of the tools do. Now what I won't be doing is going through each and every button and explaining what those do. I think a lot of that will come as we explore the tools in the process. So what I'm going to be doing is just giving a brief overview and then we'll be delving deeper down into some of these things a bit later. Now the main interface has been designed from a top to bottom, left to right sort of way. So if we look at the top, we have our toolbar going up here and we're starting off with the tools for uh, creating a new project, opening up a uh, existing one or saving our current project to disk. We also have the undo and redo arrows up here. And when it comes to keyboard shortcuts, a lot of these are the same as they are across other applications. So undo is command or control Z and redo is shift command and control Z. The next set of tools with the arrows all relate to how we control points and we'll be coming to work with these later on in the process. We have our pan tool, which we can pan around the image. We have our zoom tool, so we can zoom into an area just by uh, clicking and scrubbing up and down. And I'll return to my main arrow tool, the pick tool here. And a great thing about uh, these tools up here is that most of the ones we'll be using time and time again, we actually have access to using sort of spring loaded keyboard shortcuts. So if I hold down, press and hold down Z, I have my zoom tool so I can zoom up and down. But the second I release Z again, I move back to the last tool I had selected. So I'm moving back to my pick tool. And the same with the pan tool, that's X. So right next to the zoom, if I press and hold that down, I can pan around and as soon as I release it, it goes back to the previous tool I was working with. So that just means it's very easy to move around the image just by using or pressing and holding down Z and X to move in and out and then move around. And while I'm throwing keyboard shortcuts at you, I think we'll just do two more for this exercise. If I press uh, the asterisk on the numpad, it will zoom my window back to fit in the viewer so I can see the whole of my image. And if I do the slash on the number pad, that will take me to 100% on my image here. So we can quickly zoom in and out and uh, always keep everything nicely framed in. Now the next set of tools are where things start getting interesting because these are the ones where we're gonna start to draw our shapes up. And these shapes are gonna do one of two different things. They're either gonna be defining the area that we want to track, or they're going to be defining a mask shape if we need to do any rotoscoping. You actually could use them as both if you wanted to, but uh, my general workflow is to keep keep these separate as we'll see later on. We've got two main basic types. We've got our X spline and our Bezier spline. And what's the difference between these? So let's have a little look. I'm gonna click on my X spline tool here and I'm just gonna draw a four point object. And you can see these points are made out of two main areas. We have our control point itself, and then we have a handle here, which describes how um, tight or loose this, this area is gonna be. So if we have this very tight, we're gonna get a nice corner. If we have this very loose, we're gonna have a very soft curve coming on here. Now, the advantage with X-Spline is that if we start to manipulate uh, the weighting on one of our points, it only affects the, the weight across this curve here. We're not changing the shape up um, across the entire shape uh, as we would do if we were using a, a, a B-spline, for example. And if we want to, we can affect the weight across all of the control points in a single spline by right-clicking and moving those splines or moving the, uh, the weight in and out, moving that point up and down, in and out. And that will affect everything within the spline there. So that's a, uh, an X spline. The other one we have is a Bezier spline. And I'll do the same here. I'll create a four corner object. And I can uh, finish my object off either by coming back to my first point or by right clicking that will automatically finish off the uh, finish off the shape. So there are no um, open splines, so all splines are closed splines. Now the Bezier spline comes in and works slightly differently. We have our main control point here, and we also have 
handles on either side. And it's these handles that control the weighting through the curve here. And if I hold down the command or control key on Windows, then I can adjust these handles individually. And if I let go, those now maintain the same relative shape between them here. I can also right click on them, come to my point, either make it a corner or smooth it out if I make a mistake. Or I can also make it linear as I had before. The Bezier splines will be uh, very recognizable for those of you who have worked with the pen tool in Photoshop or the masking tools in After Effects or the mask creation tools in a uh, variety of um, editing suites and compositing software. My general rule of thumb is that um, most of the tracking objects I create will be done using the X-Spline. And when it comes to mask creation, I'll also be using the X-Spline for the majority of my organic roto and really only maintaining the Bezier splines for um, doing architectural work or areas where I do need sharp corners. So for example, if I zoom in here, so sharp corners up here on this building are much more easily described using uh, Bezier splines than they are using X splines, in my, uh, in my opinion. Now, when it comes to adjusting our shapes, we do have uh, rotation tools. Uh, and the anchor point can be basically wherever we start to click and drag. So it can be on or near a point on or near the center, where we need it to be. We can also scale again, taking the anchor point from where we first start to click and drag or translate and we just move it around. Now, if you're using Mocha V3 or above, another way we can do this is by using the show transform tool. And if I do this here, we get a bounding box going around our spline here. If I move it into a, a point where my cursor turns into our crosshairs, then we can use it as a transform tool. If we go to the corner points, I can also have the scale, doing non-uniform scale if I, if I want to, or if I hold down the shift key, doing uniform scale. I can also go to the side points here and do a non-uniform scale horizontally or vertically. And if I'm near the corner, and I um, have my cursor as the rotation tool, I can rotate around the center of the object very, very easily as well. One more thing that I can do, which is absolutely essential if I'm doing rotoscoping work, is if I hold down the command key on a Mac or control key on Windows, then I can and adjust any of the corner points, then I can be doing a distort across my shape here. And this is going to be absolutely fantastic when we start to uh, roto organic objects in motion, because it's far better to uh, to start to rotoscope shapes than it is to uh, to start to animate points up. And just this simple, just this simple thing of being able to distort upwards and around is going to make our life so much easier. The final part of the uh, interface that we're going to be exploring right now is the layer controls. And at the moment, you can see that I've got my two layers with my two shapes on them. Now, each layer can have multiple shapes on if we want to. We can just come in and we can plus come to the uh, either the X spline plus or the Bezier spline plus here and add an additional shape to any of our layers. And as you can see, even just with three shapes here, we can start to get a little bit, you know, messy in our workspace here. So we do have the ability to turn off and on the visibility of certain layers using the eyeball in the layer controls. We choose which layers we're going to be tracking or which layers are going to be uh, processed out depending on which uh, module we're in. And we've got the modules down here. We can lock layers using the lock and we can control the color of our individual layers using these two boxes here. So if I click on the first box, this is our outline tab here and I can it brings up our uh, a regular uh, system color selection tool 
So this will look slightly different on Windows, but not um, not too different. We hit OK there. We come up and do the same on this one. Let's make this a lovely orange instead. And the next one along is our fill shape, and that's just for, for when we start to turn on our mats. So I turn on all selected mats on here. I turn those on there. I can control the opacity of those with a little paint bucket. So I can get a nice sort of ruby lift uh, overlay here. And I choose the uh, the color of my overlay again in the layer controls. And we can very easily see which shapes belong to which layers. If we want to, we can also group layers together. So we can uh, select different layers together, come in and we can add a new layer group. And I will call this one Ben's first group. And inside of here, I have my layers still individually selected, but this is uh, really useful when we start to build up more complex uh, mask shapes. So we can start grouping different areas of, of a body, for example, into, uh, into the various groups. What we can also do, and something I do a lot, is also um, bring all of my tracking data into, uh, into one group layer, um, so I know exactly where the tracks are going to. And if we want to, we can, if we have a look up here, our outline and our fill uh, colors are blank at the moment. That's because the different layers in our group have different colors but I can unify all that up just by clicking on the group box here. So I know that everything in one group now has a same color. And if I want to, I can duplicate different layers as well. Move that one around. Or I can trash them and there's a line surface button here. We're gonna find out what that does when we start to get some tracking. But that's gonna be first in the next exercise. So this was a basic look at the user interface. We'll be coming back and we'll be looking in more detail a lot of these tools as we go through the rest of the tutorials. So join me in exercise three where we start looking at planar tracking in depth. <laughs>